Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 95 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In episode 95, I have an interview with Pamela Brooks, who writes the Dog on a Log books for her daughter, who has dyslexia. Now, Pamela also makes these books available to the public for all the other families whose children need decodable books as they learn to read. And really, what kid doesn't benefit from decodable books? Pamela is also creating printable board games, flashcards, and more to give families and teachers fun, affordable ways to help kids learn to read. And Pamela is an example of an independent author who is writing outside of a regular genre that does really, really well, such as thrillers or romance. And she's also demonstrating that she's actually selling far more print books than she is ebooks. And we'll get to that interview shortly. Some comments from the community. L.E. Thomas Jr. tweeted, Loving the Stark Reflections podcast and the Monty Python snippets. Thanks for all you do for the writing community. Thank you, my friend. In response to that, all I have to say is, Oh, me? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Other Twitter comments. uh, One came in from Maria R. Riger, who said via Twitter, Just finished your book, Killing It on Kobo. Very helpful and straightforward. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Maria, as well. Glad you enjoyed it. There were plenty of great Facebook and Twitter posts about Killing It for Kobo in the last week and a half. And this, of course, is all thanks to the huge promo that David Gogren ran where Killing It on Kobo was available for 99 cents in ebook format. And thank you guys so much, everyone who shared that on social media, who also left comments and shared how much they were enjoying and benefiting from the book. That that's, It's heartwarming. It means a lot to me. Now, Maddie of the Indie Author page on Facebook said, Great episode from Mark Leslie, author's uh, Stark Reflections podcast on indie writers and bookstores. Now, Maddie links to episode 87, which came out July 26th, and the episode was called You, Your Book, and Bookstores. And she talks about um, the story I share about the uh, having half of a 300-book order returned costing me more than I earned when I sold all 300 copies. And Maddie says it's the reason why I regretfully have deprioritized bookstore sales in my indie author business plan, with the exception of the rare few that take my books on a non-returnable basis, no minimum order, no S and H, shipping and handling. What's your business approach regarding bookstore sales, she asks, in this amazing indie author page on Facebook, which I'll link to in the show notes. Now, that leads to an interesting thing because it was uh, that was one of the last episodes that actually appeared in some people's regular feeds. And I've also received comments from some very helpful folks who let me know that on Player FM, as well as on uh, a couple other Apple-specific podcasts, that they thought I took August off, that I had um, stopped podcasting uh, for a month. I actually did not, but there were some changes to the way that Apple listed the podcast and that messed up the feed a little bit and I'm still in the process of trying to iron it out. I know I think uh, Chad had uh, commented that uh, he had to resubscribe uh, to the podcast because it changed in in a different way. So it's kind of difficult because if I'm telling you this and you're listening to it, you've obviously found the new episodes of the podcast. And then there's probably other people that thought I just pod faded and faded away. In terms of a personal update, uh, I recently received the print copy of Snowman Shivers, which is a digital chapbook. And I define a digital chapbook as as not a full book, like a mini book. And um, and, and I'm borrowing from the term chapbook, which was originally used for 
poetry or literary books that were originally back in the day distributed on the street and and, and maybe um, hand bound or or stapled together and they were uh, very hastily put together. So in the digital world, I call them digital chapbooks or I I do call them you know print chapbooks when they're in print. So Snowman Shivers was a collection of two of my short stories that were uh, dark humor stories about snowmen and and I put it up as an ebook and made it for free. But since the draft to digital print beta came in, I thought I'd experiment with it. Now, because it was only about 7,000 words, that would definitely not be a full 70 pages for a print book. So in order to create the print book, what I had to do was I had to obviously um, design it in such a way that I could include images. So for example, I included uh, funny images of photos that I uh, took, uh, Barnaby Bones, my skeleton on the front step in the winter. And, um, you know, the, the snowman from the cover, which was a picture of a snowman eating a small child, uh, which was a, an actual snowman uh, near my mom's house. You know, photos of the very first photograph of a snowman from something like 1853. And, um, and even related uh, images uh, to, to the winter and snow. And then I, I created an additional chapter, uh, which was like the history of snowmen. I wanted to take a look at uh, the snowmen through through time and history and and uh, characters like Olaf from Frozen and Frosty the Snowman and Jack Frost the movies and just different um, historic elements related to snowmen and snowmen in pop culture think of Calvin and Hobbes all those things and that was just part of uh, creating, um, you know, for the print book, creating it because it had, you know, selling it for five dollars, it had to be worthwhile. So I had to have more content in it, and that's just sort of a teaser because I did receive um, a message recently from a patron who asked if I would do an episode on marketing short stories and specifically short stories in ebook and audiobook. So this is a bit of a teaser to that. I'm going to be getting into a full episode in a forthcoming show, which will be a solo show where I'm going to outline, you know, the seven to 10 tips on ways you can leverage or market your short story ebook or audiobook. And I will also be producing for patrons of the show a very special behind the scenes of actually how I did, what I did step by step with Snowman Shivers, starting with what the original was and then taking a look at how I formatted uh, the print book uh, to 70 pages, what I did for research, how I put this together, compiled it, the steps I took to create the digital chapbook, uh, updating it, the two stories, and creating the print edition of it, and then how I went forward and did the audiobook myself. And speaking of the audiobook, that's a little bit of a teaser for this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. As I mentioned, I recently created a print version of Snowman Shivers that's going to be available wide through draft to digital print beta, and it's a 70 page paperback. And at the same time, I thought it would be important to record the audiobook. Now, I'm a fan of actually having professional narrators doing my audiobook, and I'm actually using Findaway Voices at the exact same time to hire a professional narrator to do one of my longer books. But this being one of my shorter books, and this being one of the books in which I've actually read, uh, the, particularly the story, That Old Cell Cat They Found, I've read this hundreds of times in public. I've read it at uh, public schools, I've read it in libraries, I've read it in bookstores, and it's a very popular read uh, for people. It's one of the, my favorite stories to read in public because it's a short tale, and I get to do voices in it, and the audience tends to really react, and I can play off the audience when I'm telling the story because it's humorous and it's a fun one to do in front of a live audience. So I thought, because I have so much experience reading that one aloud, I would go ahead and do this shorter book myself. And what I did is I used Adobe Audition. I followed directions from the good folks. Wesley, um, Wesley Ingram, who works at uh, Findaway Voices, has some videos and some in-depth blog posts that kind of walk you through what you need to do to properly create a professional audiobook file from the technical specs to the the metadata and logistical specs as well and again that just allows me as an indie author the ability to take this product a uh, two of my the you know favorite reader favorites of my short stories and make them available in yet another format to 
increase my ability to have my works available ebook, print, and audiobook. And you can find out more about how you can leverage Find Away Voices as an author over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Well, that's it for the introductory matter to the podcast. If you have comments that you want to leave on past episodes, you can go over to starkreflections.ca and leave a comment on the episode of your choice. You can also at me on Twitter. I'm at Mark Leslie. And thank you guys so much for your comments and feedback on the show. But without further ado, let's get to this great interview with Pamela Brooks. Hey, Pamela, thanks so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. So I'm quite curious to find out the origin of why you have started to write this particular series of books. My daughter has dyslexia. So, and that was a huge issue, which actually I have in a free booklet um, that people can get kind of talks about the background on, on some of those details if they want more, but she could not, I could not find books for her. The, the, her teacher would give us books and there would be, her teacher would provide us with books and they would be eight sentences long and then she would memorize them and then she wouldn't be reading. So they were worthless. And I, I looked and looked and looked for books and I found a few out of print books on eBay same thing, she would memorize them and we'd be done. And beginning phonics books, well, first of all, I went to every library in town, couldn't find any for her, went to the bookstores, couldn't find any, was ordering beginning phonics books off of online sellers. And they would come with words like leaves or Wednesday. Um, I just saw somebody else complaining the word twinkle. And when you are struggling with the word fun or it or cat, to see a word like Wednesday is devastating. What she needed was books that just had the words she could sound out with the simple phonics she had been taught and the few simple sight words that she had been taught. Um, that's what a decodable book is. It's a book that if you've been taught the phonics rules and the few sight words that are in there, then you can sound it out and be able to read it. Um, she also needed um, to have a systematic series of books. So that would each book or each level of books would gradually add more and more phonics rules. So there, I just didn't know what to do and I was totally despondent and then went, wait, I'm a writer. I could write these books for her. So I started writing them and suddenly she had like a whole chapter book that she could read and it, would, it took a long time, but she could do it. And I knew instantly that if I was having trouble finding it, so would other families. And so I decided to, to publish them. And she still reads them. She's the, you know, my big editor. If she doesn't understand something, another kid's not going to understand something. And so I, I write it so she will. So your daughter then is your, uh, you, your best editor or your first reader that, uh, okay, that's fantastic. And she's not the first reader, actually. I have um, some other kids, typical reading kids. Uh, one of them a year ago read To Kill a Mockingbird. So obviously these kids can read. And I have them read them to make sure that they understand them and that they're engaging for kids. Okay. And so then once they have read them and I know that there's nothing they don't understand in it, then she's the next reader. Okay. So for somebody who doesn't understand what uh, dyslexia is, so, you know, words like leaves and twinkle um, are obviously more complex words than, than smaller words. But how does that, how, how does that, how does a, a person with dyslexia approach that? I mean, how does that confuse them? So first of all, people with dyslexia are of, normal range of intelligence, you know, okay. uh, Steven Spielberg, Henry Winkler, um, Steve Jobs. So obviously, oh, oh, Richard Branson, um, right. these are all, you know, normal people. And then there's your normal people. Normal or above average. Normal <laughs> or above, right. But then there's also, yeah. also going to be, uh, you know, just your, um, you know, kid who wants to be a farmer that's going to have dyslexia as well. Right, right. And so what it is, is their brains just take the information in differently than a, a typically learning person's would. And okay. so what they have trouble with is saying this sound goes to this letter. 
Okay. And and so it's it's that sound letter correspondence that's the big of it. Now there's other stuff involved. Right. And I'm I'm a mom and I'm a well educated mom in the area of dyslexia. Right. But I'm not an expert and I make sure people know that, which is why I have so many experts that I can refer to when I want to talk about the specifics. Okay. Thank you. That really helps uh, for people who just aren't familiar with what, what dyslexia is. So you had this issue. You couldn't find the right books for, uh, for your daughter and imagine that there were probably other parents, other teachers, educators in the same position. What did you do at that point then? I had previously done some pre um, some per, um, indie publishing myself. I have a little cookbook. I have my novel that su- took 16 years to write. And so I knew yeah. about that process. Right. And my daughter's first teacher who retired shortly after I started writing the books, she said, you could sell these to any of the, the curriculum companies. The problem is, is I know how expensive that they would make them. And I, I'm a, I'm a mom who can, who's trying to struggle to feed my kid to educate my kid. And we're fortunate that we can hire private tutors as long as we don't plan vacations or plan for retirement, we can, we can afford that, but a lot of people can't. And so I wanted to make sure that these books stayed affordable. So I made a lot of choices. Like I do my own illustrations just because I could not afford to do that. And I can't draw. So that's I do Photoshop. But so the teacher had said, you could sell these to any curriculum company. And I said, no, I want to keep a price. So I just went ahead and did the the indie publishing thing. As I said, I, I already knew the process. I have learned so much more along the way. Um, you know, I, I had to actually reissue my books with different ISBNs. The first time I had to do it is because I have companion books. One will be a chapter book and one will be a, I call them let's go books because what kid wants to read an easy book or a beginning book? But the Let's Go books will have, like the very first book in the series, the chapter book is 260 words. That's a huge amount of words if you are a, a child with dyslexia who's just learning how to read. Or even, and, and the interesting thing is these books work for any kid learning to read with the phonics. As you learn about science, uh, I'm side sipping here, but it's 65% of U.S. fourth graders are not proficient readers, and it's because their teachers are not hot, taught how to read using the science of reading. And so these books work for those kids as well. I made them so any family can afford them. So that, that's actually, that makes a huge difference because it means that you don't have to take out a loan. <laughs> you don't have to get a second job just to be able to afford these books. Right, um, right. And then you already had had experience in... Uh, in publishing so you knew kind of how to make the books available as ebooks as well as print books is this a case where you're selling more print books than ebooks because of the the nature of I, am, yeah. I would say about at least 90 percent of my books are uh, paperbacks and like this month when i looked at my statistics i think it was four percent were ebooks okay and 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 that's quite a bit different than uh, typical indie authors, it's usually you know ninety five percent or ninety percent ebooks. So where are your print books selling? Primarily, they sell on, on Amazon in the U.S. Okay. Uh, however, I also have them with Ingram, and I never know when I'm going to get a you know a big Ingram sale. And in Ingr- with Ingram, as in with Amazon, they also sell in the U.K. They sell in Australia. I've sold some in Japan. Um, I, let's see, Canada. So primarily English speaking countries, but every right. now and then I'm surprised and they'll sell somewhere else. And then the free ebook that I give, which I'm also going to be doing a paperback of any day now, just in case anybody wants it, um, that I've sold in at least 15 different countries that I can tell. And okay. Can you get, can you sell a free book? But um, yeah. that's- well, I mean, the ebook is free because it doesn't cost you every time someone consumes it. But you do have to produce the paper costs money and or- right, right. So that they'll have to pay yeah. for. Although on my website, I have a printable PDF book fold of that. Right. It's called Teaching a Struggling Reader: One Mom's Experience with Dyslexia, and it is okay. everything that I wish I had known just a few years earlier. It's 
probably you can read it in about an hour or so. Right. However, there are over a hundred links that okay. if you want even more extensive information on it, right. and I get really good feedback on it. And it's because, I mean, I, I live the life I know, and I know what's really critical for me to have learned. There's something called Orton Gillingham, which is this philosophy that really is in line with normal teaching of phonics if you follow the science, which you, you learn a small amount of the letters and then you learn how to blend them. And then after you've learned that, you go on to the next little bit and, and you just slowly increase phonics rules, which if you look at my books is exactly what they do. And it's okay. just a little bit at a time. And a child with dyslexia just needs more repetition. And I cannot repeat to you how much repetition is ongoing, ongoing, ongoing repetition until you think you're gonna scratch your eyeballs. It's almost a direct quote from my book. It's just really? the repetition they need. It drives you crazy and it drives them crazy and then they learn to read and it's worth it in the long run. So what's the, I'm, I'm fascinated by the repetition because earlier you had said that uh, your daughter had memorized books and, and that wasn't valuable. So the difference between memorizing and repetition is, is how, what kind of repetition are we talking about? The repetition is because people with dyslexia find rote memorization hard. It's hard to remember what letter makes what sound? It's hard to remember for many of them what is a multiplication fact or what is an addition or subtraction fact. So for us, for her to learn the letter sounds, it was us sitting with her on her little swing and me showing her the alphabet letter card and saying, what is the name of this letter? What is its keyword? which would give her a visual to try and remember the sound and what is the sound that it makes. And we would do this over and over again, day after day, probably for many weeks. Eventually she got them. And then it was time to move on to the next set of phonics where we would do some sort of similar over and over again memorization until she got it. And and we still keep doing that. And in sometimes we do have to go back for things that she had mastered, but those come back fairly quickly each time. So to learn her letter sounds, there also there are various different ways. Like if you go to my website, you'll see I have game boards for practicing words, for practicing what is a syllable, for practicing because then it's a game and it's fun. Okay. And you know, there's the there's the learning and there's the memorization. So I can hand my daughter a book she has memorized and she can tell it to me without looking at the letters. So it's an right. auditory thing, as if okay. a, a you know an actor would do. Right, right. Versus the, the, the putting it in the deep brain for the, the sound to letter correspondence, that's what takes so long. Okay. And, and then for sight words, everybody has a different way of teaching sight words. So the way my daughter's first teacher taught us is she would write the word out on a strip of paper. I am gradually, as I get, get time, I am making these to put on my website to go with my books. Right. But uh, you trace the letters, you trace the words. So you might say um, the, okay? So you, you say the, you trace and say T-H-E, the. And then you do that several times until you think you're ready to write it down. And then you hide that piece of paper, you write it again, and then you check your spelling and make sure you're right. And then if it is, you cover what you just wrote. And from memory, you try and remember how to write the word the. Okay. And over and over and over again. This is, like I said, there's other ways of learning it, but that's how my daughter's teacher um, taught us to do. And, and so that is different than her reading a book that says, the sunset is beautiful. Right? Yes, she now has heard the word the, and so now she knows that, if she looks at that picture, then that's it. And oh, if I could just I'm bringing up pictures, yeah, um, you see a lot of people say, "Well, just look at the picture; it'll tell you what the word is." Well, that what that is doing is it's teaching children to guess. It's not teaching them to read. Uh. So there was a um, article out there. I think it was an APM or NPR or something article where they said, so you're reading a thing that says the horse is brown and there's a picture of a horse there. And if the child looks at it and says, the 
the pony is brown, well, they get it correct. They read it correctly. But if they say the house is brown, well, they got it wrong. Right. But the word is horse, and it's like house is so much closer than horse. And so that's oh, okay. why the only reason there's pictures in my book is because my daughter was refusing to read them without the pictures. Oh, and okay. if she was going to do that, other kids were going to do that. And so there's only a few. And then in the, the pre-reading books that I'm going to be releasing really soon, there, which is it's phonological and phonemic awareness, but pre-reading is more English. Um, I actually say in the kids' version of it, cover the pictures with a piece of paper, let the child read. Now, in that book, it's not quite so important because the first story has six letters and two sight words. So you really are not going to, by looking at the picture, be able to guess that the first thing is, I think, Nan, Nan, Nan Fam is tan. Looking at the picture, and you're not, especially a black and white picture, you're not going to tell that. But still, just getting in the habit of not looking at the pictures um, will help them learn to read rather than guess. So what is, uh, what is one of the things that you learned after, because you have several books out in the series, you have several resources available for other parents, et cetera, and, and educators. Um, what's one of the things that you learned from this experience that you, you hadn't planned on learning or that came as a surprise? What time is it? I, I mean, it's just been a, an ongoing thing. So, you know, I've, I've had to, I had to learn how to take, make my covers into CMYK for publishing with Ingram, whereas I hadn't had to do that with Amazon, which um, Adobe Acrobat Pro, um, you, you print it and you just print it as a CMYK, or if you are doing your converting to a PDF, you do it as a high print. I cannot tell you how many months it took me to figure that out. And so that's why I'm sharing it for your other people who are readers who might be wondering, how do I do this? It's right. really simple. It's just a print function in that. And even when I first got it, I spent hours trying to figure it out. It's a print function. Like it sounds it. like you, you already had a knack for research before you began this whole, this whole indie author journey. I, I did. And, and so but still, it's just, and it's one of those things, it's, it's a money thing. It's because I don't have the money to go out and hire somebody to do this, that right. I have had to do that. Um, like with the, the pictures, I've had to teach myself, I knew a little bit about Photoshop, and I knew a little bit about right. layers. I had self-taught myself um, enough of that. But with this, now I go back to some of my early pictures, I'm like, wow, well, look at what I did there compared to what I would do now. And it it's been a really fun experience learning that if I had the money or if I wanted to go with a big company that then would charge people lots of money for my books, I wouldn't have to deal with any of that. Um, but when I have, I mean, I figured it out with the first 25 books, if I had paid somebody $5 for each illustration, and that's nothing, that's not reasonable. But if you go to some of these online places, you can find somebody overseas who would do that or whatever. Right. And so it would have been $2,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and so that's why I just do this. And maybe they're not the best illustrations, but ultimately that's not what the book is about. It's not a picture book. It's a, right. a book with words that happens to have some pictures from time to time to break it up. Every now and then I need to use a picture to um, put, explain what I mean because the language is so limited, um, which is why there isn't a lot of books out there is most people cannot write at this way. I feel very fortunate that my brain lets me do this. Right. Um, because it's like you have to come up with creative things. Like I wanted to talk about a nut crusher. They were making a cake out of almonds and I couldn't say nut crusher because I don't have that ER. I still don't have that ER. And so I had to call it a nut crush thing. Well, I have one thing where they're using a ladder and I think I had to call it the step on thing or something like that. Right. And so I put a picture of a ladder in for that, but I've only had to do that two or three times. Usually I can figure out some way around it. Or when I wrote, I have a book called The Blimp, and which is, that is introducing words with five and six sounds in it. And I wanted to walk, write about them writing on a blimp, 
But to do that, the language would have been too complicated because I couldn't say the word air. And as I researched blimps, I could not figure out any way to get them on that blimp with the limited vocabulary that I had. And so I ultimately decided that they would just see a blimp. And then, okay. then the dad could explain that, it, that there's gas that goes in and out. No, it's not the gas that, that makes our, I, can't, I couldn't say hot car. I think I had to say van at that point, or maybe even truck. It, it's not the kind of gas that makes the truck go, go is a sight word, at that level. Um, it is the kind of gas that, I don't even remember how I described it, but so you have to work around that. Right, wow, wow. Yeah, it, it sounds like, I mean, this is, uh, you have to really understand uh, the intimate details. It, it, you can't just approach it and say, oh, I've written a children's book, for example. I can write one of these. This is a very, very unique set of uh, understanding and skills that I think you have to have in order to do an effective job for this yeah. audience. Yeah, if, 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 if you were to take a phonics progression, um, there are many different programs out there and they all have a slightly different phonics progression, which was actually one of the things that I struggled with early on is, but how do I meet the needs of every kid when the phonics progressions are all so different? And the answer is I don't. I, I write this, um, my daughter's teacher who she's, she's amazing. Um, she and I sit down together and she's the one that guides the progression we're doing. She uses it. This is what she uses for my daughter. Now, sometimes I'll say, will that work? Well, not sometimes I always say, will that work for other kids out there? Is this going to be confusing? Can I put these things together? And, and so we make sure that, that it's going to work for the average kid who's going to read this. But ultimately, it starts with, with my daughter's progression. Um, but you can, anyway, so somebody could take any of the curriculums and they could write books to that if they could come up with the way to tell a story with that limited phonics. And there's a reason why I couldn't find books. And there's a reason why I don't have a lot of competition is because most people can't do it. And so to get a whole story going with this, um, there's just, people just don't do it. It's just these early ones are so hard to write. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing the details about, about this process and, and, and why you wrote these books. Now, for those who are looking for resources, uh, where can people find out more about you, uh, about the resources you talked about, as well as about these, uh, these books that you've produced? So my website is dogonalogbooks.com. And so I have the books yeah, you know, I have links to the books to sell there. I don't sell them myself. And then there are printable board games. There are printable, well, printable all kinds of things. There's flashcards, there's game cards. When you play the games, you know, every time you land on top of the dog, you, you have to read a card. And there's a story that goes with each thing. Um, but uh, then there's also like the chicken cards or the bat cards or the pig cards that break up and you have to do something fun with those. Um, there's, there's dictation sheets, and then there's all the materials with the pre-readers. There's something called sound cards, which is basically just alphabet cards. Um, and um, so those are all on my website, and then you can buy the books from pretty much most online, well, I shouldn't say all on, online resellers. You can get them, obviously, from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, in other countries. I've got on my website, when I find places, I think in Australia, it's take a lot or something like that. Right. So there, as I find those, I, I list them on my website so people know where to go to. And I guess because they're available through Ingram, uh, somebody could go to their local bookstore and order them. For, they could to, order them. Yeah, right. or, or their local library uh, right, as well. And I would love to get them in libraries. Um, there is actually, I keep getting contacted by different groups that want to put them out and or want to get them out to um, people. And so one of them now is working specifically on trying to get decodable books, not just my books, but all of the decodable books because different kids are different levels or they have different interests or whatever. So they, they are trying to get as many decodable books into libraries as they can. Um, 
they are with the bookseller. I have them as non-returnable just as, as an author. We're a single income family. My books are available worldwide. I cannot afford to have 500 bookstores buy them and then not know what they are because that's, that's one of the challenges is not everybody knows exactly what my books are. And so I'll get comments like, well, the grammar's not right, or this is really kind of boring. Well, I'm, you know, using 30 sounds here. Yeah, it is. And, and, and no multisyllabic words and very limited sight words. So yeah, it's not as interesting as Winnie the Pooh yet. They're getting, I mean, I'm now starting a, a mystery that's going to span five books. And so with each step of phonics, you'll get a new book. And so if you want to read it, you got to learn more phonics. Um, so <laughs> as time goes on, I can do that. Yeah. Oh, that's so, fantastic. Yeah. And, and also for people who want to know if their kid is struggling or an adult is struggling. And I, I briefly touch on adult literacy in the upcoming third edition of teaching a struggling reader, but that it's not only is it, I have it listed to be free worldwide. So anybody who draft to digital goes through Apple and Kobo and all of those things. I don't know how their programs work, but I do have it listed to be free. You can also go to my website and read it in its entirety, or there's the downloadable uh, PDF book fold because I figure maybe a school principal or a counselor or somebody wants to give people information and they can just print it up on 15 or 16 pieces of paper and then they can hand it to a family. And then the downside is all the hyperlinks are as end notes and you know how long URLs can get, but at least they get the basic information without that. And so that's also available. Now, some of the Amazon sites internationally, they randomly change them so that they do cost something, and that's out of my control. But if, if, you place, if you're in Australia and you see, then just go to my website and you can read it for free. Okay. Excellent. Well, Pamela, thank you so much for what you do to help uh, other parents, to help folks who have challenges with reading uh, dyslexia. And thanks for spending the time sharing some of that with me today. Thank you. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. I really love the fact that this is an example of an indie author who is publishing a book that fulfills a need that is missing in the market, and that's fantastic. It's also an indie author who is controlling the price, so if this had been published by an academic press, uh, the cost would be significantly higher, and part of the reasons for that may be the, the cost of the images, etc., but Pamela talks about how she managed to keep the costs down on this uh, in order for families to be able to afford it because it is uh, expensive uh, to purchase books uh, for uh, readers who have dyslexia. And, and along with that is the, the fact that this is a genre that's not usually uh, something that sells very well because it's not romance, it's not thriller. It fulfills a niche market in an incredible way and provides high value to the customers who really, really need it. And similarly, it, it also does something a lot of indie authors don't do is it sells, like she said, 90 or 95% of her books sell in print rather than ebook. And uh, ebook tends to be the domain for most indie published titles, but because this fulfills a critical need and word gets out, right, from family to family, uh, teacher to teacher to educator who are familiar with the books and know the value in them, that really helps her sell print book. So that's uh, one thing to reflect on. The other thing is I really was thinking about how when Pamela was writing the book, she talked about she couldn't use certain, you know, word combinations like ER for ladder and things like that. And it reminded me of the value to a writer of honing your skill by playing a game such as Taboo. And no, I'm not talking about that 1980s movie about taboo sex. I'm talking about Taboo, the board game from Hasbro. And it's, it's a game where you, you have a partner and you have, I think it's two minutes, and you can't say a certain phrase. So, for example, you're trying to get your partner, uh, you, the, the word uh, is peak. And the word you can't use when you try to get them to figure out what the word is, is you can't use the word summit or mountain or point or career or shape. And in two minutes, you have to convey to them that the word that they're trying to find is peak. A similar one might be the word you're trying to convey to them is mirror, but you are not allowed to use wall, sea, reflection, looking glass, or rear view. 
Now, that's a great exercise as a writer when there is a taboo word or a list of taboo words you can't use and yet you're trying to convey something. And that may be a good warm-up writing exercise that you can try. So if you have access to uh, the game Taboo, you can pull out a card or you can use some of these examples. You know, write a paragraph that uh, is trying to convey the word stress, but do not use the words nervous, tense, pressure, anxiety, or work. Okay, you've got five minutes. Write a paragraph that conveys stress without using any of those words. Again, it could be a useful warm-up exercise just to flex those muscles because when you're limited on what you can and can't say, it's interesting to see what you can do with that as a writer. And I love challenging myself in those creative ways, particularly when I'm trying to get the juices flowing and when I'm trying to get, uh, get the muse all pumped up and psyched about what I can and can't do in a particular situation. Well, that's the end of episode 95 for the Stark Reflections podcast. Again, this is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Hope you found value in this fantastic interview with Pamela, as well as in the Reflections. Hope you enjoyed the episode, and I hope you come back next week. And so until then, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.